evening, welcome to lecture one of topic two of unit three, the movement of charge. Uh, this video will be covering the main ideas of chapters 7.1 and 7.2 in book one, and you should complete this reading before class. Here are your learning attention and success criteria. Please pause the video, complete the KS table down here on the right. Okay, so having a look at here, we can see, as we would expect, start of a new unit, we have a lot of knowledge verbs here, we've got some describes, explains, identifies, defines, so really this is all knowledge stuff. We've got well, what is charge and current, if we don't know what these are, it's pretty hard to identify it or describe its movement. Uh, and then secondly, well, what is the law of conservation of charge? Uh, sometimes it can be phrased around a little bit white, different ways, so law of electrical conservation, or law of charge conservation, or the uh, law of conservation of charge, a few different things we can throw out there, okay? Uh, but it all, it all means the same thing, so let's get into it. Uh, so on the topic of charge, uh, the ancient Greeks knew if you rubbed amber with fur, you can make things stick to it. Small things like uh, feathers, uh, and little bits of fur and other things like that. Uh, but the concept of charge wasn't invented until, or developed until around the mid 1700s. Benjamin Franklin, uh, he did a similar experiment to what we've done in class and noted that the rod gained a property, which he called charge. And because it gained something, he called it positive. Now the textbook has a little bit about the history of this, but the conclusion is that, well, we discovered the electrons and that electrons were negative. And what's important for us is that they are the things that move. Now you may recall from year nine or the nuclear physics unit if you're in year 12, that the atom is comprised of a positive protons and neutral neutrons in the nucleus and negative electrons orbiting that nucleus in a picture kind of like this. Uh, not exactly uh, accurate anymore with our understanding of electron clouds, so if you're in chemistry you might be screaming at this, but it gives us the rough structure. Now, the, if the number is in balance, because here we have uh, two protons and so we'll have exactly two electrons with it for a normal atom, if we imbalance it through gaining or losing, this is called an ion. Okay. Uh, so equal balanced, unequal ions. And some examples of this would be fluorine, it likes to gain one electron, becomes F minus, uh, or sodium, it likes to lose an electron, become Na plus. So note, if you gain something here, you're becoming negative. If you're losing something, you're becoming positive. So this property of charge, uh, we do have a unit, we measure it, and it's called coulombs. Um, it's a French word, so you've got to try to sound it with a nice French accent, the Coulomb. Uh, but we give it the symbol Q, which is a bit of an annoyance because we've just done some heat, and heat had the symbol Q as well. Uh, and when we do electromagnetism later this year, there's going to be another Q that pops up, uh, which is just very annoying. Um, one Coulomb of charge is a very large number of electrons. So one Coulomb of charge is 6.25 times 10 to the power of 18 electrons. So when you're really dealing with an experiment, um, we're dealing with either milli coulombs or micro coulombs, so 10 to the negative 3 or 10 to the negative 6. Now, um, with these things here, uh, the reason this is so big is because when they were working with it originally, um, the numbers were just you know, too small, and so they had a very large amount of electrons once they figured out how what the charge on an electron actually was. Uh, speaking of electron, uh, the fundamental charge, and this is going to be a constant given to you in your formula booklet, is equal to negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So if you look at the difference between this number and this number here, you can see that you know, there are quite a number of electrons in order to make up that one coulomb. Uh, this and this are inverses of each other, by the way. This negative out here is important because for electrons, obviously it's a negative charge, as we set up here at the top. Uh, if you were asked, well, to work with protons, you would use a positive number instead of a negative number. Um, often, uh, a text might say that, oh yeah, it's using an electron, and you have to recall that, oh, 
we know the charge of an electron, it's this number, it's in our formula booklet or in the textbook if you're going to be doing homework, so you've got to go look it up. Okay? Could be a good number to memorize, but remember it is there. Now, there are some work examples about how to calculate the number of electrons in some amount of charge. Uh, I'll leave you to look at that. It's not an equation provided in the formula booklet, and realistically, if you understand what this is, then this is pretty easy to derive as this is just one divided by this number and you'll get to that number. So the conservation of charge was fairly important um, and we've seen a few conservation laws so far in physics. Uh, we saw it with energy, we saw it with kinetic motion uh, and heat, uh, and you've done it in chemistry with mass, uh, nuclear physics with uh, both in year nine and last year, and the but also the total amount of charge must be conserved. And here's a fairly formal definition for it. In an isolated system, that means things aren't moving in and out of it, the total amount of charge cannot change regardless of changes within the system. So like we saw in class, even if we separate some charges um, within something, we're not creating or destroying any charge there. We're just moving it around inside to create an imbalance. So, charges on their own are pretty boring, they're just sitting, sitting there. Uh, we want to move them, and that's where we get into current. So with current, uh, when a battery, and we'll talk about batteries in our next video with voltage, is connected with a conductive wire, has to let electricity flow through it, uh, to a load, and a load means something like a light bulb, uh, the charge will move through the wires, and here's a nice little animation of it. We've got a little battery there, we've got a light bulb, and we can see here these little blue electrons are moving around on the path. If any of this was broken, the electrons would stop moving, and our light bulb would turn off. That's what a switch does in your home. This is current. Current is defined as the rate of charge moving per second, how much charge moves per second and has the symbol I. Here's the formula, I equals Q, remember Q was charge, and T. So, so far we haven't used C for current, and we haven't used C for charge. Uh, C, you remember, pops up a lot for constants, uh, and the speed of light, because that's a very important constant. So, sometimes these letters don't make sense, and you're just going to have to memorize what they mean, guys. There's no easy way around it. Measuring current though, the unit is another level of annoyance. The unit is measured in something called amperes, which is, at least has the symbol A. Uh, often you'll hear it um, referred to as amps, uh, but amperes is the full name. It does have a capital because it is named after a guy. So this is probably the most annoying physical quantity in science. Current starts with a C, but the symbol is I. The unit has the symbol A. Um, now, most of the things that we're going to be working with will have currents in milli or microamps. I'd recommend you grab like your laptop charger and find it on that brick part of the charger. It'll be written there what the current flow through it is. Uh, it'll be the some number of milliamps, or it might be uh, maybe even close to one amp if it's uh, you know got a bit of energy draw on it. Your fridge probably uses about six amps. Okay, it does a lot of work, so it uses a lot of uh, amperage. Uh, an electric stove in your house, if you have an electric one, not a gas one, uh, that's about 15 amps. So again, uh, some things at home use a lot, but most things don't. Let's have a look at a couple of examples. Uh, here's our first example from chapter 7.2. Uh, there is one in chapter 7.1, but as I said, I'll leave you to have a look at that. And we have here a charge of 30 coulomb passes through a light bulb in one minute. What is the current in the bulb? So if we pop back to our equation here, we're dealing with this. We have our current, our charge, and our time. So uh, we've got a charge, Q equals 30. And we're told that time equals one minute. Remember, we're going to convert that into our SI unit, which is seconds. And now, plug and play. I equals Q over T equals 30 over 60. I do know that the formula on the previous page, and I believe the formula booklet does this, it uses lowercase Q. It doesn't really matter in this case if you use uppercase Q, because you're going to be using uppercase Q for charge when we get to electromagnetism anyway. Um, so everyone sort of just interchanges it quite easily. Uh, don't stress about it. 
and we can see here this must be an amperage of 0.5 coulomb. Yeah, pretty straightforward. Let's have a look at the next one. Two-parter, we've got a current of two amperes passing through a light bulb torch, uh, light bulb in a torch. Calculate the amount of coulomb passing in one second and then how many electrons pass in one second. So that's going to refer back to that um, definition of how much charge is on an electron. So, uh, let's load that up. We have a current I equals 2 amps. Um, we're told we're looking for Coulomb of charge, so that's our Q in one second. So T equals 1, that was easy. And Q equals our unknown. I equals Q over T. So, oops, let's just do that. 2 equals Q over 1, or Q equals 2 Coulomb. Okay, now there's a couple of ways that we could work out the next step here. Uh, the work example gives um, one perspective, uh, and we can also use the other perspective in terms of well, how much, how many electrons is equal to one coulomb. But they both give the same thing. So the first way of looking at it is if we know the charge on something and we divide it by the charge on an electron, okay, or the charge per electron, we'll know the total number of electrons. So uh, if we go n, n for number, equals our charge, this thing we just worked out here, divided by the charge on an electron, which is a given to us, 2 over 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 gives us an answer of about 1.25 times 10 to the 19 electrons, and E for electrons, sometimes E minus. But let's have a look at the other way. We also had the statement that in one coulomb of charge, one coulomb was 6.25, uh, 6.25, yes, uh, times 10 to the 18. Okay, so if we take that and double it, because we want two coulombs, if that's times two, that's going to be times two, that will also equal us 1.25 times 10 to the 19. You might go, wait, isn't 25 times 25.5? But 6.25 would be 12.5, and that's 12.5, but up at the next, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, sorry, the, the next power, the next time power of 10. Okay, so didn't make a math mistake. That's about as hard as current gets at the moment, okay? Pretty easy questions. Most of the questions down below are going to be about definitions and understanding. So, let's get into some important um, terminology that we need to know. The first is conventional and electron current. Ben Franklin stuffed us. He defined positive charges moving in his first experiments. And because of that, we have conventional current whenever we're dealing with circuitry. And this says that the charge flows from, excuse me, the positive terminal of a battery to the negative terminal of a battery. Looks like this. So here's our definition. Now, here's the same image I used before, but, uh, and it does come up a little bit blur blurry, I can see that. Um, but you can see the arrows are going the other way. On FET, you'll see that there'll be some buttons for, um, conventional flow and electron flow. So you know, have a play with that if you wish to, and you'll see uh, the differences between the two. So here, the arrows, and I'll just draw it, are flowing this way. Okay? Now, let's go and have a look at electron flow then, because in reality, it's the electrons that flow, it's the electrons that move. Protons don't move, they're too big. So electron current, is the movement of electrons from the negative back to the positive. So here's our picture from before, and we can see that the electrons are moving the other way. Uh, just as a note, 
this sort of orangey gold end of the battery is always the positive uh, and you can tell when you're doing batteries because there'll be a little bump on the top to show you that it's the positive end uh, the flat end is the negative the bumpy end is the positive uh, we'll also have to worry about the same thing when we're dealing with the power packs and we'll do that in class so by convention and that's because Ben Franklin wrote it this way originally people started writing textbooks started working with it and then we discovered the electron later on and its charge on it and they looked at this idea and going who we could rewrite every textbook or we can just keep it like this and put a note in future textbooks that things actually go the other way and that's what they chose so by convention unless I tell you otherwise if I say current we're talking about conventional current from positive through to negative only if a question asks you about the electron current or the passage or the pathway of the electrons do you care about the reality we're just going to deal with positive um, conventional current so I'll just say current from here on out but we're going to deal with the positive version of it but we've got two types of current you might have heard of them before they are called DC and AC so we have two types uh, and the current movement we talk about are these AC and DC now DC stands for direct current and it means that everything moves on the same path continuously like we've seen so far in the animations AC stands for alternating current and here's a diagram that compares these two and that what that means is the electrons move backwards and forwards along the wire if you watch here in this animation for a minute you see DC just moves this way while AC goes this way for a little bit and slows down and goes back the other way and then goes back the other way so it keeps changing direction until eventually the animation skips back and then you get a little hiccup the stuff you use at home your computer your phone your TV these are DC if you change the current direction through your devices they'd probably blow up that's why if you're going to make a phone charger for example you need to make sure you get your wires wired up the correct direction because if you try to pump electricity in through the wrong way your battery's likely to go kaput AC is uh, I mean and DC is dangerous okay. um, Ben Franklin so, uh, sorry, not Ben Franklin. Uh, Thomas Edison uh, used to electrocute animals as a way to demonstrate that DC was scary and you should use AC because that's what he was developing. Um, but AC is really good for transmission of electricity. So the power lines, they work on AC. Uh, everything up to the wall on the side of your house and then it converts to DC for flowing through your house. Okay. So how do we measure these things? Uh, to measure a current, we use what's called an ammeter. Okay, ammeter, amps, at least that makes a little bit of sense. Measuring current means that we're going to count how many charges pass a given point in a second. That's the formula, I equals Q over T, the amount of charge that passes divided by the time it takes. And so well, to set these up properly, they must be placed in series with an object so that we can measure the current going through the object. So here we have our current, our circuit from before, our electrons are moving this way, they come up through the bat, they come up through the light bulb, they make it glow, and then they come through the ammeter, and the ammeter just counts them for us. And on they go. And the number might be a bit small there, but it's reading 0.9 amps. Okay, nice and easy. But to make this work without you know stuffing up our um, circuit, the ammeter needs to have a very low resistance. It needs to not push back against the electrons very much. Otherwise, it would slow things down and we wouldn't be getting a real measure of the current. Uh, and so if you place it in parallel, the electricity will go through the ammeter and not the item that you're trying to measure the electricity going through and probably blow it up. And here's a graphic of it. So here is a path we can see leaving the battery coming up to light bulb, there's a, there's a split here but it's not connected so the electricity won't flow through here, that's, that's an open circuit comes up, goes through the bulb, gets measured, 0.9 amps, da 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 there's nothing coming off from there, it can't go back through there so it just ignores it and off it goes but here I've closed the path and two things probably stand out one, the battery's on fire two, 
there is a very much smaller current flowing through here and you can see the rays of the light bulb are um, that's what I'm looking for uh, in another direction the reason nothing's moving along here is because FET when it reaches a sort of crash state slows down the animation a lot and you might look at these and go it's going backwards why is it going the other way I thought electrons went around the negative the reason it looks like it's going back to backwards is that they are moving so fast my um, GIF creating software doesn't capture it at a fast enough speed and so it looks like it's going backwards kind of like how when you look at a tire on a uh, advertisement or on a movie or on a YouTube video it looks like the tire is going backwards even though the car is going forwards it's an optical illusion and you may also notice there's a very very big number there I believe that's about 1.2 million amps uh, so all the elect nearly all the electricity is going nah that's an easy path I'm going to go through that path and the sheer amount of current being generated blows up the battery so we don't want to do that okay so before we finish off the video I would like you to practice your definition skills using a Freya model to define current so where I've got word here in the middle chuck current fill in examples non examples facts you've got lots of information uh, in this video of different things about current come up with your own definition and then go look up the definition in the back of your textbook to compare your definition uh, against the definition there so I believe it is on I will look this up very quickly for you it is on the side of page 211 you'll probably be able to find it at the back of the textbook as well in a glossary and you'd be able to find it on the syllabus document as well which is a good place to look so in this video we have learnt the following we have looked at the concept of charge and charge particles. We've looked at the law of conservation of charge as a sort of good reminder to keep in mind and finally the concept of current as the movement of charge. For your entrance slip to class I'd like you to complete questions 1 to 7 in chapter 7.2 check your learning. Uh, you can do the ones in 7.1 but they're not too relevant to the syllabus so just have a look at them you should be able to do them in your head. Uh, copy your answers into the 3.2.1 space on eLearn. Remember, we are under topic 2 electrical circuits, not heating processes. Thanks, guys. Have a great night.